Hey everyone, this is Adam Ellenboss from Nightlight Astrology. Today we are going to take a look at Mercury's opposition to Uranus, which is happening in the early part of this week. So we are going to take a look at some of the archetypal significations of this combination today. Uh, I'm going to give you five things to watch for, and we're going to talk specifically about the importance of emotional resilience and emotional regulation. These are concepts and themes that go along very nicely with any kind of Mercury Uranus dynamic, but especially when you have Mercury in a water sign where the connection to the mind and mental emotional health issues are often present. So we'll be looking at that today and I hope giving you some good useful thoughts and tools to work with uh, this transit. So anyway, that's our goal for today. Remember to like and subscribe, share your comments and reflections if you've got them. We're trying to get to 80,000 subscribers on the channel by the spring equinox. Um, <clears throat> we really appreciate all of you for helping us grow the channel. Thank you. You can find transcripts of any of these daily talks on the website, which is nightlightastrology.com. Promotion for the day. I'm going to take you over to the, to the uh, website here. Go to the courses page, click on first year course. This will take you to the first year course page. New class begins November 16th. While the early bird sale is over, you can still use the need-based tuition option if you are someone who could use a little help to make the class happen. If you are experiencing any kind of financial hardship or you live on a limited uh, income, we understand that people are coming from a lot of different places and we wanna make sure that studying astrology in a really in-depth, immersive program like ours is accessible. So if you want to come study astrology and deepen your own hobby or practice or even develop a professional practice, our program is really there to meet your needs regardless of where you're coming from and what your starting point is or you know, kind of what your intentions are. After I sign off today, there's an informational video telling you more about the program that's tagged on. So if you stick around, you can learn more about it. All right. If you have any questions, by the way, about anything you find on the website, email us info at nightlightastrology.com. <clears throat> All right, let's put the real time clock up and take a look. Here we have it. We have the approaching opposition. Here we are on Tuesday, October 29th. And this opposition is in almost just a, a degree or two away. So be between a degree and two degrees away. Let's step this up by some hours. And we'll see that as the day goes on, we're getting Mercury into about the one degree range by tonight. And then by tomorrow, we will see that Mercury is flying along and making that opposition late afternoon. That's central time for me in the USA. Late afternoon, tomorrow, Wednesday, the 30th. And if we give this a little bit of separation, then we'll see that the three degree separation range takes us to Friday, November 1st. So we're riding those shock waves, those typical Uranian shock waves for a few days, but that is the heart of the transit as the week goes on. So uh, today I want to talk about five things to watch for. It's one of my favorite things to do, give you a list of five good things to consider given the archetypal combination. And the first one that I have for you are lightning strikes. I like this image for anything Uranian, but especially Mercury Uranus, um, because there are so many different applications of the image. For example, a lightning strike can be the delivery of an original idea or insight, which is very much in line with Mercury opposite Uranus. <clears throat> Breakthroughs in our thinking that land suddenly and quickly and illuminate and are maybe somewhat shocking, uh, that is very much a Mercury Uranus pattern. So lightning strike can kind of fit the image of a sudden original insight, a new idea, or a sudden shift in how you are seeing, thinking, communicating, or perceiving. And it comes just like that. The other thing that lightning strikes communicate are sudden, unexpected, and sometimes destructive pieces of news or information. An impulsive thought or idea can be a destructive one at times. Uh, Things can happen very suddenly and unexpectedly as Mercury, the messenger of the gods, will deliver karmic events in our life in ways that are sudden and often disruptive. And that disruptiveness is going to be experienced by some people as, you know, a little the agent of chaos. Uh, Mercury Uranus oppositions bring an element of disruption that sometimes feels like things are being uh, things are falling apart before they're being put in, put it before they are put back together. Excuse me. So 
One thing you have to watch for with this combination is the possibility that as the opposition expresses itself, it will be sudden, quick, fast, brilliant, and very disruptive. So uh, when you get that sudden news that is difficult and unforeseen things happen and you suddenly uh, get the news that uh, someone you love is sick or someone that you know has had a difficult um, or unfortunate circumstance arise and there's they're someone you know or you're close to, uh, that is a kind of Mercury as messenger delivering Uranian unexpected news. And the opposition is typically what makes that unexpected news or event a little bit more destructive or uh, disruptive. So disruptive doesn't always mean dis destructive. Disruptive can be, well, that was unplanned for, that was unpredictable, that was erratic, that was so spontaneous and unexpected. The opposition will usually have us reeling to make sense of or to incorporate or make room for or integrate the experience because there's oppositional tension. And so the feeling that we are being polarized or thrown off our center is often part of oppositional tensions between any planets. So a lightning strike that illuminates, a lightning strike that disrupts, something that may try to throw us off our center, even when good and unexpected things happen in Mercury Uranus fashion, they can still throw us off our center. Um, you know, you, I mean, this is a, a, I guess a really kind of generic example. You think about how excited someone would be when they win the lottery. It's, it's kind of a destabilizing event, even if it's like, wow, unexpected good news. So um, there can be a way in which we are uh, challenged to keep our center this week. And, uh, you know, no one is in some perfect center place. But what I mean is to keep a feeling of balance and flow, to, to keep a feeling of, um, okay, I can move with this, I can work with this. I'm not being thrown into a space of um, self-neglect or self, you know, self, kind of self-medicating in, in destructive ways because I'm so thrown off or I'm reacting or I'm becoming really impulsive or I'm having really volatile emotional reactions, all of which can happen under big Uranian oppositions, even if they're exciting. So again, just something to keep in mind. Lightning strike can also be about the sudden way in which something is simply illuminated. Mercury in the sign of Scorpio is deep and like an investigative journalist. That's a phrase I like to use for Mercury and Scorpio. And so when it contacts Uranus through an opposition, sudden changes or shifts can happen because things that have been hidden are now suddenly available or accessible or suddenly understood or seen. So that lightning strike can also be about the illumination of things that are hidden, but often, again, in quick ways. So lightning strikes can also be a signal of inventiveness. And that's what I'm going to move. I'm going to move into my second piece here. I guess I could, I could really go, I could, I could stretch the lightning image to cover everything, but um, I do have some other categories on my list. So I'll go into this one now. Innovation would be that Mercury Uranus combination that is associated with inventiveness. Now, inventiveness can be utilized to discover or make something new. It can be a way of in, inventiveness can also be a way of solving problems. Mercury Uranus is an amazing signature for coming up with problems to complicated uh, or coming up with solutions, excuse me, excuse me, to complicated problems. So, Mercury's opposition to Uranus this week, don't be surprised if things that are tangled or stuck or feeling, um, you know, there's there's big question marks in the air around something will suddenly catch some movement because there are a series or a string of events, so, so Uranian sudden insights or surprises that lead you to solutions or answers and ideas that can liberate stuck energy. So the liberation of stuck energy in the mind uh, in the intellect and in communication is also a hallmark of Mercury Uranus, where there's a sudden ability to say something that you've been feeling um, uh, it's been difficult to say, or it's been it's it's been a feeling of fear or inhibition or something like that. Now suddenly you'll say it. Well, this is also the problem. Because, you know, sometimes it'll be like foot and mouth syndrome. So at any rate, the innovative part of this though is about originality and novel insights or experiences or the feeling of I've never been here before. This feels new. I'm thinking new thoughts. I'm having new ideas or insights. 
That is also a hallmark of this transit. Now, the third one on my list is oppositional defiance. Oppositional defiance can be, um, I'm not talking about, I, I use that phrase because it's linked with, I think, a, um, a behavioral diagnosis of some kind, but I'm not using it in that way. I just mean it as a, as a kind of generic way of describing the archetype which is that there is a way of uh, when oppositions arise of in values or there's arguments or there's just different approaches or techniques or strategies at play and they're being you know debated or discussed which way should we take what idea is the one we should use um or uh even when we're working with other people and we have to make regular compromises it's like the art of negotiation is ongoing in most places in our lives right so you will run into hard oppositions with Mercury opposite Uranus where that feeling of it's my way or the highway is um, noticeable. Or you may run into a feeling of um, I'm not going to do what you tell me. Uh, you can't tell me what to do. Or just a resistance to authority that's not rational. You know, some people have wounds around authority figures and will therefore have to do some work as life goes on to heal that relationship so that truly, you know, benign or even, you know, like just really positive authority figures can uh, be accepted. You know, it's like you have a boss at work or you have some place in your life, you need to take direction or maybe even it's even allowing yourself to be persuaded, be persuaded or guided along by a spouse or a friend. But if you've had to fight for your sanity or you've had to fight for your own right to exist from uh, and wrestle it out of the hands of some kind of corrupt figure in your life. Well, it's not so easy to face moments where there are tensions around authority figures. So, you know, a lot of people have, are, are very aware of this too. And, and you know, working on it, it's not like I, I've, I've met a lot of people over the years doing astrological counseling who've said, yeah, I have an issue with authority figures. Well, how do you deal with that? Well, I just have to be aware of the fact that like small things can trigger me when someone tells me to do something or asks me to do something and someone's taking the lead in a position or something like that. I have to just notice that I'm, I'm more regularly or easily triggered. Anyway, so be aware of that tendency this week within yourself. And if there's something that needs resisting, resist, right? But if there is some kind of, um, let's just call it, I don't know if, it, if it's a little bit more uh, pathological. If, if there's some feeling of like, I, I'm just being triggered in this situation and no one's really trying to get me to do anything that I have any issue with, then we might also look at how we might look at what is a healthy relationship with authority look like starting with our own, right? Because part of our own authority is the inner voice that says, you know what, it's okay to accept guidance or it's okay to accept leadership from someone else or in some situation. Um, on the other hand, don't be surprised if you're a person in a position of leadership or guidance and you run into this attitude from someone else and you don't understand it or you feel personally hurt by it because as far as you can tell, you're not doing anything evil. You're just playing the role you're meant to play. So this can come up and with Mercury opposite Uranus, um, they can get a little explosive. People can suddenly, you know, you're not gonna control me <laughs> if you, if you, ah! <laughs> you could freak out <laughs> so watch for that all right anyway next on my list is resilience and this is kind of one of the two things i really wanted to talk about today because um resilience is a really important concept when it comes to mercury uranus dynamics because one of the things that we experience typically when mercury opposes uranus is the the potential for mental instability and obviously we have a pretty close connection for most of us between mind and emotions especially when mercury's in scorpio now we have a really pronounced connection between mind and emotions as a water sign so what happens when we get into spaces that are dysregulating or destabilizing well there's a lot of things that could, we could say about that space. One is that for, for many of us, uh, there is an opportunity in such a transit to develop better coping skills or to develop resilience, staying power, to be able to work through and work with difficult energies, if you want to call them that, or difficult people or difficult thoughts or emotional patterns. 
or difficult passages, if we want to call them life passages, little life seasons, it's important that we have resilience. One of the easiest ways, and this is just my interesting own personal opinion, so feel free to disagree. But one of the ways I think that we develop resiliency is to make sure that not everything we are doing is completely easy. I'm not someone who thinks you should go do a hundred pull-ups in the rain or, you know, something like that. But I do think that it's helpful for the brain to go on a hike, you know, push your body a little bit, uh, do some cardio or go to the gym or take a yoga class or do a little meditation or even just forcing yourself to practice that instrument that you love. Um, when we kind of sit down and make ourselves do things with a little, that's a little hard. It doesn't always feel so great. I think that we, you know, just my personal experience, we develop the ability to do when, when things come up unexpectedly with very mercury Uranus, we have better coping skills because we have some resilience inside of us that we've cultivated. When we avoid anything difficult at all costs, you know, people that are difficult, the world that is difficult, you know, relationships that are difficult. And we just, I don't know, hide out watching Netflix or something, or, you know, just stay on our phone all the time. And we, we start isolating ourselves and insulating ourselves and protecting ourselves from anything that's difficult or troubling. Uh, well, we're going to have a harder time when things come up that are beyond our control that are, that kind of infiltrate our bubble of, of protection or safety. It's not bad to have a bubble of safety or protection, right? But if we also don't have any skills for dealing with uh, the wild that exists outside of our bubble pans world. We were talking about recently Mercury and Scorpio is very, very pan like um, then we're going to be in trouble because we won't, we won't sort of know and recognize the face of adversity because we don't have a relationship with it. So one thing that's, I just broadly say for a transit like this, are you going to this week suddenly develop resilience? If there is none, no, uh, it's a practice and it's something that for many of us will take a little while to, to work into many of us probably listening to this also have resilience, right? Or maybe we need a little bit more of it. Maybe we need to develop a little bit more of it. But the point is that developing resilience through any kind of anything that, that is like a, a source of joy, but practice, you know, it takes a little effort. Then I think we have the ability when we develop those things to, um, to really stick around and be in it when we need to be in it. So when Mercury Uranus pops up, there are often events that happen suddenly and usually not for that long. I mean, a transit of uh, Uranus to your natal Mercury is a lot longer than one in the sky happening over a couple of days. But anyway, the point being that if we can learn to work through these difficulties because we've developed some resilience, it becomes a lot easier to navigate a transit like this. So one of the things that these transits often do is call into question, well, how resilient are you? How, uh, you know, how, if you're not sleeping well, for example, and, or you don't take the right amount of sleep or you don't drink enough water or something like that, it's, it's amazing how quickly during really stressful times that are out of your control, how easily you'll get run down, you know, and then you get sick. So a, a transit like this, anytime there's like a big Uranus transit, I, I always notice that the question of resilience comes in and nobody's perfectly resilient. Everyone can get their boat flipped over. So I'm not talking about some kind of impenetrable, infinite strength, but these transits, when they come through with Uranus will, remind us that, look, if we, you know, we, if we live in a little insulated bubble and we don't kind of find our edges a little bit in life, it becomes a lot more difficult to deal with edges when they come up outside of our control. I think that's the main point. So I'll move on. Number five is regulation. I put this in the title today because this is the other thing that I think becomes really important. One of the ways that we also weather these storms is not just by developing resilience, but it's also by understanding how and what we can utilize to regulate ourselves. By that, I mean emotional regulation, mental, physical regulation, whatever you want to call it. This is a word, a buzzword that I've heard a lot about. I've been reading, there's a like a, a book club for parents 
excuse me, uh, at my kid's elementary school. And so I've been reading about emotional regulation for kids and, um, you know, kind of cooperative regulation for human beings in general. How do we co-regulate with each other? It's really interesting stuff that I've been reading about um, and uh, connecting to other parents about in parenting, uh, you know, it's kind of kind of like talking about parenting and schooling and stuff like that. Anyway, um, one of the things that I do to regulate myself, I mean, I have like a list, right? I play my guitar. I have my daily sadhana, you know, which has changed over the years. It's been, sometimes it's been long periods of meditation or prayer or silence. Uh, for the past couple of years for me, uh, physical exercise has been kind of my, um, my, my little temple space. Sleeping, eating well, you know, eating healthy, drinking lots of water, going for walks, reading, uh, playing my guitar. Did I say that one already? Those are my, and obviously like my relationships. So self-regulation. And then I think there's also sort of a co-regulation with other people that we do, you know, spending time with Ashley, spending time with my girls, spending time with my friends or my dog. These are the, these are the places that I go to kind of constantly be, you know, it's like, it's like we're, we're just, we're a living organism. So we're never going to find some static, perfectly balanced state or, you know, it's not, it's not about perfection. It's just kind of about <clears throat> uh, flowing along with life. And what are the habits that we have of allowing ourselves to sort of regulate and find a healthy spot? I think regulation and resilience go together with a transit like this, because just as much as we might need to just develop more resilience, more staying power, more ability to endure and persevere during difficult times, especially unexpected, sudden, quick, fast turning movements that happen with a Uranus transit like this one. Uh, you may also need to know what regulates you. You know, is it a hot bath? Is it a walk? Is it journaling? Everyone has something a little bit different. But going to those practices when these kinds of transits come up is invaluable because it is one of the easiest ways to make sure that your response and your interaction and your participation with the transit is healthy and not su super destructive. It's already an erratic and disruptive transit. So why add to it by not? tapping into a little bit more resilience and some of the best ways that we know how to regulate ourselves. So I'll leave you with those thoughts. These are the things that are on my mind this week. Make sure that we tap into our resilience inside, know how to self-regulate, watch for themes of oppositional defiance, catch the vibrations of innovation, liberation of the mind, thoughts, ideas, and then watch for those lightning strikes, which can mean a couple of different things. Can be very exciting, can be uh, very illuminating, a lot of problem solving energy in the air this week, but also just that hallmark of Mercury Uranus, which is the unexpected and the sort of disruptive. So, anyway, if you have a story to share as the week goes on, don't forget use the hashtag grabbed. This is a good one to hear from you guys about. So anytime you ever have a story on the channel with a transit, use the hashtag grabbed or email us your story grabbed at nightlightastrology.com. We aggregate stories and share them. Just don't share any story of a transit with us that you don't mind us resharing in an episode, storytelling episode. All right, that's it. After I sign off right now, there is an informational video about the upcoming year one course that starts November 16th. I hope to see you in class. Don't forget need-based tuition is there for you. If you can use it, uh, great. We hope that it will help a few people out and uh, hopefully we will see you in classes soon. Bye everyone. Hey everyone. I'm glad that you're sticking around to hear more about the year one program that's coming up. The program starts on November 16th of this fall. And I am here today to tell you all that the program includes and why I think you really like it if you're thinking about studying astrology. So a few practical details about the course as well. The class begins November 16th, as I mentioned, but it takes place on Saturdays from 12 to about 2 or 3 p.m. Eastern time. So that's 11 to 2 central. And typically classes are about two hours long. Sometimes they run over with Q&A and discussion, but you can always plan for about two hours and you won't miss any of the actual lecture content for the day. You may have to duck out a little early if Q&A or discussion is extending. Sometimes it does, which is why we say between two and three hours, but typically it's around two. 
All of the classes are recorded, so if you can't attend live, you are more than welcome to watch the recordings at your own pace and on your own time. You have life, lifetime access to the recordings, and everything is housed on a student website. I want to actually give you a um, just a little preview of what that student website looks like. So I am going to open up my own version of Thinkific, which is the platform that we use. So here's are some of my courses. These are all the nightlight courses I teach. You can see on the page. But I'm going to tune into, let's go to Nightlight 28, which is the section that began in June of 2024. So here you're going to see that we have uh, orientation instructions, course information, class links, and calendar. Everything that you need to know how to access the course is there. And you'll have a version of this in your own panel that you get set up with when you enroll. Um, and then our lessons are laid out. So lesson one, we have the video, the audio, the slides, the transcript. We have the Q&A box transcript so you can see what people were saying in the chat box during class. We have flashcards. We have a workbook. We have planet and sign glyph flashcards. We have bonus material um, videos that we like from YouTube that we link you to. Say, check this video out, check that video out. They go along with some of the things we talked about in class. So every lesson has material for you to go as far as you want with, but the main thing is the video, audio, slides, transcript, et cetera, are all listed there so that you can download and watch it on your own time if you can't attend live. Again, the live classes do happen on Saturdays for this cohort starting November 16th. That is our first day of class. And then um, going forward, it always meets on Saturdays and we give you the class schedule to map out and the breaks that we have, the study sessions that we have, everything's mapped out on the class calendar for you. Uh, so um, so those are just a few practical details that, um, you know, just to kind of start us off with. So I'm going to take you over to the website, which is nightlightastrology.com. And I'm going to share with you some information about the program and sort of walk you through what it includes and what you can expect. So it is an almost year-long program. We typically finish between 10 and 11 months out of the year. Uh, it can depend a little bit on some of my teaching and scheduling because sometimes I teach at conferences and it may delay some of our, our modules by a week or something like that. But it's typically around 10 to 11 months that the program lasts. So we call it our first year program. At Nightlight, we have a uh, program for absolute beginners. You may want to check that out if you are like brand spanking new. That would be eight to 10 hours of content that's really meant to set you up for the first year course. We sort of assume that if you're coming into the first year program, you already know a little bit about astrology. For example, you have some familiarity with the signs, planets, and houses. Maybe you know what aspects are, but you want to learn more about what they are. But um, if you are really at the very total entry level space, then try astrology for beginners. And when you take that, uh, you could do that right away and then join the first year course in November and you'd be perfectly set up for it. But anyhow, in this program, over the course of about a year, we work through 30 lessons that I lead. And those lessons are all two to three hours each, including lecture, a little break, and a Q&A portion where we open up for people to come on mic and camera and ask questions and have an interactive discussion about the material for the day. The program is broken into modules that cover a variety of topics in ancient Hellenistic astrology. That is the earliest era of horoscopic astrology. And so if you don't know a lot about the different schools of astrology, Hellenistic astrology is going to be the kind of astrology that you see a lot of astrologers practicing nowadays. It's become more popular in the last 30 years or so. Um, and that is due to the fact that a lot of ancient texts with some of the original techniques of uh, horoscopic astrologers were recently translated into the English language, and it's created this renaissance in terms of the use of ancient approaches to astrology. Um, I have a background in modern psychological, archetypal, and evolutionary astrology, and so of course I bring those things to the table, but the course is primarily focused on the excavation of ancient techniques and the spiritual philosophy that ancient astrologers also espoused. The closest thing that I can tell you to what that looks like is you know, ask to ask this question, do you resonate with the philosophy that you hear me take on my YouTube channel? If so, then you're going to love this course in terms of its philosophical and spiritual approach, because the spiritual approach to astrology that I teach is really at the heart of the program. Um, and that that's a big part of my life. I approach 
uh, astrology from a spiritual standpoint. It doesn't belong to one religion or one particular school of thought, but you will hear me talking about things like the soul, the belief in the transmigration of the soul. You'll hear me talk about the need to be soul-centered in our client approach to counseling in astrology. You'll hear me have an appreciation for psychological dimensions of astrology, but also ancient astrology is really very, very good at developing your predictive capacity. We talk about what kinds of predictions are appropriate, how to make appropriate predictions, how to be the right kind of astrologer for our clients without inducing any fear. Uh, so there's a lot of care that goes into the development of this craft. But ancient astrology is really amazing when it comes to honing your predictive abilities. And then what you'll find is in this program, there's also a pretty significant emphasis on the psychological dimensions and client care. Anyhow, we go into the roots of ancient Hellenistic astrology and its techniques in this program, and the 30 classes are broken into modules. We work through uh, the history and philosophy. Uh, we work through um, planets, houses, signs, aspects, uh, essential and accidental dignities, and then we get into approaches to the delineation of natal charts. And then at the end of the program, almost a third of the program is dedicated to live client readings, where you're going to see me meet with a person and apply what we've been studying for an hour long reading. We take a break, we come back, and then we workshop. How did I do that? Why did I make these choices? How did I handle this or that that came up in the reading? And it becomes easily the favorite part for most students of the entire program, because by that point, you've got so much theory that you're really ready to see it put into action. We alternate those live client practice sessions with um, hands-on practice where students get to bring chart questions into class that we work on. And that's also something that most people really love. A lot of people will look at the curriculum and say, well, I already know planets, houses, and signs, and aspects, and dignities. But not if you haven't studied Hellenistic astrology, because the approach that ancient astrologers had to these topics is vastly different from the approach that modern astrologers take. So you will be, in a sense, relearning basic things in a brand new way. And I think a much more enriching, deep, and philosophically clear way. It's really nice to know the why behind things. This program and Hellenistic astrology in general is very good at helping you understand the why behind everything that we do. Also, um, it's really important to participate when you study astrology in a living lineage. So one of the reasons I don't let people jump ahead to my second or third year programs is because I want you to be entrained to a lineage, a particular way of doing things that comes from an astrologer who has a very living, busy, active practice and who has had teachers themselves. I think that's important for astrological learning. That's the model that my own learning take. And so that's what I really want students to take away from my programs. Anyhow, um, so all of that um, aside, the second year program focuses, after we build our understanding of the basic delineation techniques of birth charts, in year two, we move into timing techniques, which is all about when the karma of a birth chart is going to be active and expressing itself throughout the course of a lifetime. That's year two. Year three focuses on the development of counseling skills uh, at a much deeper level. And then we also have a one-year horary program, which is about the development of a very specific predictive technique that can be a really amazing tool to add to your kit. That is four years worth of training programs that we have. However, I want to mention that many people take our classes just for the sake, um, purely for the sake of their own personal growth. Taking these programs is very much like being taught how to utilize a technology that for yourself will be deeply useful for the rest of your life and maybe for close friends or family members around you. Many people come through our programs taking that benefit away. We'll study through all four years of our programs with no intention of being professional. This is their hobby. This is a spiritual tool that will have many, it will pay dividends over a long period of time. However, many people without the intention to practice come into our courses and discover that they're actually good at it and may end up reading for other people part-time. And then there are students who are deeply, intensely motivated to practice for other people. And it is not that our programs really make those people successful. They, our programs contribute to your development, but it really is that some people have a calling to practice professionally. And um, these programs are designed to give you all the tools you need to develop that confidence and to develop a really coherent set of tools and to entrain yourself to a lineage, which you can also develop your own um, unique style out of. 
So uh, those are some of the, you know, the kinds of people that take our programs, you might say. So the 30 classes on the year are then um, broken into modules. And in between modules, we have two course directors who are present in all of the classes and they lead breakout tutoring sessions where you can come in and review or ask questions about the module that we've just completed, which is usually anywhere between two and three classes each. So those breakout study sessions led by our tutors are outside of the 30 classes and very useful. A lot of people like to attend those because they also offer opportunity for community and just lively conversation. We also have 12 online webinar classes led by guest teachers that we host throughout the year. Those are free. And if you can't make them live, they're all um, uploaded into your student folder. You also have an interactive group forum discussion staffed with tutors who typically respond to questions that you have about the material within 24 hours. So if you can't attend a tutoring session or you just have a random question on a Tuesday night, you can pop it in there and you'll get an answer. Um, we also have a ton of bonus material, optional quizzes, flashcards, tons of supplemental material that is there to help people go as deeply as they want. We have a reading list that is expansive and that reading list, we don't expect anyone to accomplish. It's more so a resource that we give you saying here, if you want to know all the things I've read, if you want to know all the things that I love, if you want to know all the things I recommend, here's a master list of everything for each lesson. You could go, you know, PhD level if you wanted to and read thousands and thousands of pages, or you might find that there's just one extra book that looks really interesting and you want to pick it up. But we pride ourselves on making sure you have a ton of resources. You have lifetime access to all the class recordings. You can email our staff or me throughout the year with questions. And uh, my staff will also defer to me in the case that they don't know the answer to a question. So that is what the program includes. It starts November 16th. If you would like to join at the bottom between now and October 15th, our early bird payments are available. So that saves you some money off the cost of the course. There is a 12 month installment plan that is cheaper than our normal plan, a one-time payment plan that a one-time payment that's uh, significantly cheaper than our normal one-time payment. So you get these little sales that we do until October 15th. We also have need-based tuition assistance. So if you are someone who would like to take this program, but you are on a fixed or tight budget, uh, we have a, a, um, an application there. Click apply now. Just tell us what you need. We, we give a range. We say between this dollar amount and this dollar amount, what can you spend? And then we set you up with a plan for that tuition number per month. And that is available for anyone. We ask people to apply early because um, those spots are limited. But um, we are really accommodating. We try to make sure that nobody's priced out of a, um, some, a spiritual education. Like this topic should be very accessible for people because um, I believe that the divine is speaking through the sky and like anyone should have access to understanding what it's saying. Right. So anyway, um, that is a bit about the program. I hope that this has been useful for you. If there are any questions you have, you can look over the curriculum content on the page on the year one uh, page. There's more information there. Check out the FAQ section for more questions. Email us info at nightlightastrology.com. And I hope to see some of you in class soon. I think this is going to be a really powerful program because it's also starting right as Pluto is moving into Aquarius. And within the year, we're going to have a Uranus-Pluto trine with Uranus in uh, Gemini, these airy signatures and the connection between Uranus and Pluto make for a very powerful year to advance our understanding of astrology. So it's a great election year for studying. And I hope to see some of you in class soon.